Happy Saturday and welcome to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark. It's Saturday, July the 18th, 2020, and we're back here again on The Deal to talk about all the things that are going on in the world. Obviously, COVID-19 has reemerged as the top story after uh, over a month of talking about uh, police brutality and uh, George Floyd and uh, all those subjects related to the Confederate monuments. Um, we, we've we've tried and tried to make sure that we have the the most uh, informed guest on here, and today is no exception. We have an all star panel today. Uh, with us today is, of course, as always, Val Atkinson, our resident political science uh, expert. Uh, but we have some new folks in today. Dr. Regina Miltier Rock, who's a pediatrician, who we're going to we're going to pick her brain about how COVID nineteen affects children. Uh, Dr. Angela Elgin, who's a COVID ICU nurse and former uh, fire chief, uh, and uh, which is interesting. I want to hear that story. And then there also uh, Dr. Cheryl Catchings, who's a community psychologist. She's been in with us before. She's our she's the person that keeps us sane. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna depend on Cheryl to, to get us straight. And uh, as always, I want to start with Val Atkinson, and, and we'll bring in all the other guests in just a minute. But but uh, Val, uh, it's been another rough week. North Carolina had been doing very well. That's where we are. North Carolina had been very well in trying to stem the tide of uh, a COVID-19, but um, it just doesn't look good here. And the governor this week decided he was going to announce his plan for reopening schools. And, and one of the topics I want to cover this week is, you know, children and COVID-19. Talk to me about where we are in North Carolina, but also where we are in the country with this whole notion that we're going to be able to reopen schools in the fall. Well, Ed, uh, thank you very much for that question, starting with this very important subject. Of course, uh, some of us don't have children in school anymore. I have grandchildren, though, and uh, they're going to be affected by this decision as well. My concern goes beyond uh, the children, not that I don't care about them, but I think not enough emphasis is being placed on uh, teachers and the staff, uh, even down to the bus drivers, uh, the people inside the class, the substitute teachers. Uh, the last uh, information I got in terms of the average age of people who were contracting the uh, COVID-19 was uh, somewhere between uh, 22 and 37. Uh, that is right in the wheelhouse of most teachers. So if, if those are the people that are getting sick, they can trans, you know, they can uh, transpose this information or this disease onto the kids, which then take it home, uh, and and we're all in a lot of trouble. But I wanted to put some uh, attention on that as well. Clearly, we have to make sure that we're in a place that does not harm us. We're not going to try to throw away the lives of people trying to get the economy going again. And I want to be clear about that that too many decisions are being made on the side of getting the economy straight, because I heard it clearly on MSNBC, uh, when one of the commentators on, I think it was Joy Reid, uh, was basically saying, you gotta connect the dots. And in connecting the dots, kids first gotta go back to school to free parents up to go back to work, uh, to free employers up to open up fully and have governors and 
County commissioners and mayors approved that opening so that the economy has an opportunity to get back to normal and thrive. Well, you know, whether or not a business makes it or not, and Donald Trump is, is one that can tell you this, there are people file bankruptcy every day. They go bust. They could turn around and build another business again. But when you lose a life, that's it. So we can't make that comparison yeah. about trading off the lives of kids and teachers and staff in order to get the economy back up and running. I see that's where things are really going. Well, Val, I, those are all really good points and it, it gives us an opportunity to bring in our medical experts. And I, I wanna start first with Dr. Regina Miltier. Uh, doctor, you're, you're a pediatrician and yes. I'm pretty sure you've been looking at what they're saying concerning uh, COVID and how that affects children. A, a lot of folks are saying, in, in, including the president, oh, it's okay because, you know, kids are less susceptible, whatever. Tell us the truth about COVID-19 in children. Um, COVID-19 in children is quite a bit different from COVID-19 in adults. And I don't think we truly understand the full impact of COVID-19 in children because um, children aren't being tested like they like adults are being tested. Um, they are tested when necessary, when there's a contact, um, if they're a newborn born to a mother who has COVID or who has been exposed to COVID, um, children who have been admitted to the hospital. Um, early on and still now, we believe that children handle the disease um, much better than adults. Um, they might have minor symptoms that we think just a passing viral illness, sore throat, headache, etc. Um, but children are infected and children have died um, from COVID-19. Um, so we shouldn't take children lightly um, when we're thinking about COVID. And, and that's why this conversation about reopening schools across this country is a very important conversation. Well, yeah, you're right. I want to remind the folks you're watching the deal. Uh, we have an all-star panel in today. You, that was, you were just listening to Dr. Regina Miltier, who is a pediatrician, but I want to turn now to Dr. Angela Elgin, who is a COVID ICU nurse. I want to, I want to talk to you about the realities of COVID. You know, uh, doc, Dr. Miltier just said that children can get COVID, they, they can die from it, but they can also spread it. And, and that means taking it home to a parent. And Val mentioned earlier, uh, maybe exposing a teacher or a custodian or a bus driver. You have been in the COVID ICU. Uh, uh, Dr. Elgin, tell me what it's like to see someone who's suffering from COVID-19 in the ICU. <clears throat> it's, it's pretty awful. Um, initially, when COVID first started, the, the, we would put a breathing tube in everybody initially because we didn't know what to expect from this. We knew that it was airborne. So in some respects, putting a breathing tube in someone and putting them in isolation kind of somewhat controlled it a little bit. But now um, we are not um, rushing to put a breathing tube in because we're finding that that is not actually good for morbidity and mortality rates. So what we're doing now is allowing people to kind of um, work through the COVID, if you, if you um, understand that a little bit. So they're short of breath, they can't get their breath, and there's waxes and wanes of, I really can't breathe and I feel like I'm gonna die to, I can't breathe, right? And there, there seems like that there's no gray area in there, well, it isn't. Um, across the board, they cannot breathe, but they have periods in which if they're trying to talk or even if they're just trying to sit up in bed, it is an exercise. It is um, energy draining. So I have taken care of people in the last several weeks in which they would, one lady in particular, I'll tell you a, a little bit about her story. So her family, they, they were all in one home. On the last week of June, her father died from COVID. Her sister became COVID positive. Her mother began to get sick. The patient that I was caring for began to get sick and decided to go to the hospital. 
while I was caring for her, she was more worried about, am I going to live? Am I going to die? What's happening? My mom is sick. My dad, my dad just died. And my sister is COVID positive, but she's taking care of my mother, who we think is COVID positive. So it is that circle of um, worry that's happening. And she has to figure out what do I need to do to get better? So she asked me, she said, so are people that have this disease, are they doing okay? And, you know, I had to kind of lie to her because some patients are doing okay and, and we celebrate those patients. And then there's some patients whom are not and we are very sad about those patients. Mm -hmm. So I can count <clears throat> on more of my fingers of patients that I have taken care of that didn't fare well than I can count of people that actually walked out of the hospital. Wow. So back to her story. Mm -hmm. She was trying to sit up in bed, literally, and that just took everything out of her. Within 24 hours, she was on a breathing tube. So this disease is really no joke. And the, the awful thing about the disease is that we're still learning about what, what its pathophysiology is. We're still learning so much of what is the etiology. We, we know that people with diabetes, high blood pressure, heart problems, they are at high risk. But now we're seeing the, there are the younger people that are coming in and I, I've had a patient that had asthma and she ended up doing okay, but she's still in the hospital and still can't get past 60% of oxygen. So you, you need, we're, we're transferring people out of the ICU if they do not need um, less than 60%, right? Mm -hmm. um, so she can't get out of the ICU because she can't get above 60%. So we tried to turn her down to, um 58 percent and within 10 minutes she um didn't fare well with that so we had to turn her all the way back up to 90. so i say all of that to say um it is a very insidious disease in that we are still learning about what it looks like we know it's shortness of breath but all of the other things like i've had patients that have seeds i've had patients that have had heart attacks I've had patients that have had heart attacks and strokes, and it affects the body literally from head to toe. They develop clots in their legs. They develop clots in their lungs and have never had a, any type of bleeding disorder ever in their life. Well, so I, I am happy about one patient that I took care of that was also HIV positive that really, really, um, the first several weeks were, was not doing well. And one day I went back to work and he was sitting up, he was off the ventilator. He couldn't get out of ICU at the time because he still required a lot of oxygen, but he was able to wave at me. And I literally tried to keep him alive by titrating different medications to keep his blood pressure up, going up on the blood pressure medicine, going down. He was also on dialysis. So we had to contend with um, the machine just not working well with the dialysis because remember I told you they clot a lot. So his blood was clotting while he was on dialysis. So it, it is a very challenging and very sad situation. Well, that, that brings me to a, a, a good question for Dr. Cheryl Catchings. We talked about this early on in the COVID crisis, uh, Dr. Catchings, about uh, the psychology of people who refuse to wear masks or refuse to, you know, think about other folks who, who have uh, flaunted, you know, just good public <laughs> health advice and, and, and perhaps have spread this. All those folks who were out for the 4th of July and Memorial Day and, and, and even people out protesting that maybe weren't as careful as they should have been what what is going on because i i just wrote about this in my piece for yesterday uh, a gentleman in ohio who refused to wear a mask he went on to facebook almost every day taunting people who wore masks and then two days after he was diagnosed he was dead talk to me about the psychology of people who still refuse to wear masks 
even after what Dr. Elgin has said, even after what Dr. Miltier has said about how serious this is, what's going on here? First of all, Vince, let me just thank you uh, and Val for allowing me, us, to come back on this, on your show and continue to talk about this because as, as the, uh, the doctors have already said, there's so much going on and this is fluid. It's changing every day, every week. And, and it's really sad the, that this has now turned into this political discussion, this political divide that is making people choose between the political process, the cultures, and everything so that now um, it's not about health systemically it really is about um, you know if you believe that you know what the president is saying if you're believing what the governor is saying if you're believing what the mayor is saying then you know one group of people are going to do one thing one group of people are going to react you know um, across the nation people are looking at their sense of entitlement um, I don't have to wear a mask you can't make me and we see all of that shaking out um, and on in, in communities and uh, across the nation which is just absolutely crazy because this is science this is medicine it has nothing to do with the political party um, because the COVID doesn't care what party you are. And I don't know how many times that needs to be said, Dr. Fauci, every medical person has said that and, and screaming until the cows come home and people are still turning this into a racial political divide. And that's why it's so important that in our community, we understand that we need to follow the science and we need to follow the CDC. Um, you know that the recommendation or what has happened recently since the last time we spoke is that uh, because the administration is not uh, wanting to be distracted from re-election, um, they have now decided that they are not going to let CDC medical and science experts now have a daily uh, briefing, not to even have the data come out so that other people can get it and put it out. Now all of the data is going directly to the administration and they will decide um, who gets it and if it's going to be released, uh, you know, and, and who knows if the data is accurate at that point. Again, in our community and our culture, we already were below the belt to begin with and now COVID has come in and changed everything and it's paramount it's imperative it's an urgent situation right now to get our community to understand the importance of following the science this thing is no joke because now it's in the air you don't have to be within six or eight or ten feet of someone to uh, uh, be impacted well, that, that, that's, that's a good point. Uh, that brings us uh, to a, a, a place where we might want to stop, take a break. And when we come back, Val, I want to pick up with you and, and Dr. Miltier. And uh, I, I know you had some questions for her. Uh, so we're going to take a, a short break. And when we come back, we got our all-star all panel, Val Atkinson, Regina Miltier, Angela Elgin, and Cheryl Catchings, to talk about COVID-19. And I, I want to figure out if school's going to open in the fall. We'll be right back after these messages. Here are AARP's top tips on caregiver preparedness during coronavirus. Form a caregiving team. Inventory essential supplies and medications. Make a plan to stay connected. Maintain self-care and follow CDC guidelines. Learn more on our website. Welcome back to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark, and uh, we're fortunate to have our panel of experts this week, uh, Val Atkinson, who you can usually find him on Sunday mornings. Uh, I hang out with him on WFXC and WFXK for Radio 1 and the uh, Raleigh-Durham Market uh, on Connections. Uh, but we got folks from all over the United States today, uh, Dr. Regina Miltier, Dr. Angela Elgin, and Dr. Cheryl Catchings. They're in to try to make some sense of COVID-19 and try to figure out uh, whether or not kids are going to be going back to school in the fall and amongst other things. I know Val, you had a, uh, you had a question you wanted to ask Dr. Miltier and I, I'll, I'll let you, I'll throw it to you and let you ask her. I, I will do that. Uh, uh, Regina, I want to pick up on something that Cheryl had mentioned earlier uh, regarding taking the data and sending it to the administration and not being sure that that data is accurate when it, 
comes back. Let's talk a minute, if we might, about how that's going to impact uh, our decision making as parents, uh, as community leaders, as people in your profession. How that's going to impact that if we don't get correct information. There's already been one young lady, and please forgive me for not uh, have committed her uh, name to memory, that quit her job or was fired because she refused to manipulate the data as was requested. So I know it can have some impact, but I'd like for you to talk about how important and how critical it is to have good, sound, reliable data coming from some place that we can trust to help us make our decisions. That's a great question, Val. And it's been unnerving that the data has been removed um, for the Senate, from the Centers for Disease Control but most importantly, the way we're going to have to approach reopening our schools is based on our local data and our local experts, um, public health experts, educators that are local to every community. Um, we'll also have to depend on um, most of our state um, direction um, and the science that we get from our states, um, most of our governors, as well as um, local health officials. And we're going to have to look at this individually, locality by locality. Um, that data will help um, the decision makers decide when schools can open and how schools will open. There was a statement that came out um, on June, July 10th, and it was written by the American Academy of Pediatrics um, which has more than 80,000 pediatricians as members, the American Federation of Teachers, the National Education Association, um, that joined together to write a statement um, because statements had been released from each of these organizations and they became politicized. Um, they were misquoted, information was taken out of context. So they all came together to write one statement. And the essence of this statement is, this is not a political issue. It is a health emergency issue. And in the middle of this issue are our children. Um, our children are you know, the most important parts of our future. And they are all very dependent on us as adults to make the right decision for them. So whether schools open or delay their openings, um, modify how they look when they opening when they open should be a local decision um, regardless of the ability for us to get the national data yeah that, that's a good point I mean I, I, I I'm just concerned though that the, the data has just been so muddy that I mean you, the president gets up and says that you know it, it's okay children don't really get sick from this and, and some people take that to heart. So the, the, a lot of people don't even hear the data, they hear the politics or, you know, or whatever. I, I'm just really, really concerned about that. Um, Angela Elgin, I, as a COVID ICU nurse, and you're seeing these people as sick as they are, uh, the one thing I keep thinking about is, you know, in the old days, they had stared straight, you know, and they'd show the program it, 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 or bring in people to show them. Have we shown enough of what it's really like. I know it's hard to do because you have to be in isolation and you, you or whatever. I, I don't know how you get cameras into the ICU to show how bad this is, or do you just, you know, I, I know the people who are taking care of folks are drained when they're finished taking care and they don't want to talk about it all the time. But have we done enough to scare people straight into this? Because again, I think I hear a lot uh, from the folks who don't want to cooperate, who, who just want to open everything back up that, Oh, it's only this percentage of people. It, they don't take into account that that one life that's gone is gone and never coming back forever. It's almost like a selfishness where, well, if it's not me or my family, I don't care. I mean, is it possible to scare people straight if we they really knew how bad this was? No, I don't. I don't believe so. And I'll tell you why. Um, people do not believe that it's actually a reality until they have been touched personally. 
and directly or indirectly, meaning indirectly you have the friend of a friend, right? Um, because it's not in their face, because it's not um, a part of their daily living that they actually have to have some inconveniences for. And we're talking outside of wearing a mask, we're talking outside of all of those things that we talk about that you have to do. I'm talking about they actively have to take care of a person that has COVID in their own home. And as a result, they can't just walk into their room. They, ha they have to put on the whole garb, as we say, before they can go into room. So unless they are really inconvenienced and unless it touches them personally and directly or it's somewhat indirectly, we will, people will never understand how awful this is. But if I may go back a little bit and, and also add to the conversation just before of um, the data, um, not the CDC not allowing that data or the administration not allowing that data. When COVID just started, the hospitals was getting um, information from the CDC on how we are to wear our masks and giving us guidance on can we rewear the mask or can we not rewear the mask or if we can sterilize the mask. All of those are important things to my life and are important things to how I am able to ensure that I'm taken care of my colleagues are taken care of, but most importantly, me not um, bringing that the COVID home to my family. So we were using the CDC for guidance on how we're, we're supposed to take care of patients and as well as ourselves. So now we are not certain that the information that we can get at this point is going to protect us. Um, I am grateful that I work at an entity in which there is research constantly. So I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of um, organizations will have to depend on their own research in order to keep us safe. But research is not like you do something in 24 hours and there you have it. It takes a long time. It takes testing and retesting. It takes validating the data. It takes ensuring that the data is consistent. It, it takes a while before that. And my life means a lot more than um, someone just trying to skew the numbers or skewing information. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not to say or not to minimize um, um, just in talking about children, but it's a lot bigger um, than, than that. Is there, <clears throat> there, there are, there's going to be a lot of fallout. Yeah, I want to remind everybody you're you're watching the deal and or listening to it on the podcast. Uh, we got uh, Val Atkinson, Regina Miltier, Angela Elgin, and Cheryl Cashings in with us. Uh, we're trying to make some sense of uh, what's happened. That COVID nineteen is not going away. We were told by certain folks that uh, the warm weather was going to take care of it, or it would just mis miraculously disappear. Uh, we were told that we were uh, on the downslope and. And right now, it looks like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and all those places that had it uh, really bad back in March are, are doing okay. But we all know that it can come back. And we know uh, mostly southern states right now are, are really catching a lot of hell over COVID-19. Uh, 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 Dr. Catchings, uh, uh, talk to me about, we, we've talked about, you know, trying to educate people, communicate to people, find people where they are, whatever. Do you know of any, any initiatives or, you know, uh, ways that, you know, maybe we can get to the folks who are most vulnerable, uh, maybe not getting the information that they need? Because, you know, especially in our community, we still, you know, depend a lot on either word of mouth. And I still get the little memes on Facebook that's, you know, talk about 5G and <laughs> and all those things. And I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to educate people that some of those things are not true. Uh, what do we do to try to educate people better? Um, that's an, an excellent question. And again, just like uh, Dr. Angela was saying, there's a lot uh, that's happening behind the scenes to get the word out. You know, we are a village, right? I'm a village teacher, a proud village teacher. And we have to really go back to the way that we used to get information. You know, we are a community and a culture that very much believes in that, that oral tradition of distributing information. We, when we get hurt, uh, people tend to 
go either to the medical center or their faith center to get information. And so there are initiatives that are happening right now as we speak to bring all of those entities together to get the word out to the trusted community leaders that Val was talking about so that if that's what it takes for people to think, oh, so-and-so said it, so therefore it must be true because there's so much noise happening out in the community and as uh, Dr. Regina said, it's so sad that our children are being caught in the middle of the firestorm. But in the meantime, um, again, people need to look at uh, the, co the, the county public health where you are, what is the information that's coming from the school district, and then families have to really take a look at what's happening in my family. Who are my trusted advisors? But what's happening in my family? If I know that I have a family and we have some medical challenges, then we need to look at that because it's not just about are the children going to school because that's a whole nother issue. But we have to get to the place where do we even need to go outside? We have always been, um, you know, a, a people that realized there were some choices that need to be made, might be hard choices, and we needed to move forward. And I say that because I'm originally from Michigan, and so you know I am a Miss Rosa Parks, uh, 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 you know, mentee, right? And so just like that was the catalyst for the change back then in the civil rights and voting movement with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, I think that, you know, all of the police reform issues and everything that have happened with George Floyd, George Floyd is the, is the, the 2020 version of Miss Rosa Parks, right? So we need to be able to get folks together meet them where they are and get information out there and make decisions that are going to help our village. And that means um, you can't go to the hangout spot. We, we don't have to go to the club. You don't have to be seen in the new outfit. Pookie not going to care. You know, uh, you, we ain't got to do that. Everybody got a pookie, right? I know they do. But we, we have to stop all of that and make the decisions so that we can move forward. Well, well, and if we don't, we're going. What what Dr. Angela said. I, I mean, I, I just cannot stress enough what it, we are about to see in the data, our own data in our own communities and in our families. Mm -hmm. um, what's going to happen in the next four weeks? Because we're not going to need to look at the TV to see the the uh, consequences of choices that people have made. Well, I'm glad you bring that up, and, I, and my cousin Pookie's not going to like what you said about him. Uh, Dr. Miltier, though, <laughs> Dr. Miltier, I, I, that brings up an interesting point. Cheryl says in four weeks we're going to see something that we don't want to see. Right now, we're seeing the increase in infections and people reporting you know, positive tests and those things. Those are leading indicators, right? That doesn't indicate how many people are going to be dead at the end of this. We've also seen an increase in spike in deaths, but... It, I don't think it's anywhere near what it's going to be, but we don't have clear representation of the numbers. Places like Florida who fire, and Val mentioned this early, who fired their statistician because the numbers didn't look good, but the numbers are obviously bad because Florida and, and Governor DeSantis is, is having to backtrack. In four weeks, are we going to see a lot more dead folks because, you know, just the, the increase in the number of infections is, this is astonishing. 70,000 a day are being reported. That's not the ones that have it. Those are just the ones that are reported. Yes. Um, I think we're going to see a real uptick in the next four weeks. And remember, we're still um, in the first um, COVID episode. We haven't, we're not even in the second one that's slated to come in the future, in the fall, in the winter of 2021. Um, I was just in Virginia Beach um, the end of June, beginning of July, not to be at the beach. Um, they're really in my car and, you know, never got out of the car. But it was just astonishing to see people in groups that obviously weren't family um, just walking around the, the beach and the streets and going into the bars and restaurants that were open. Um, no face mask. They were just being who they were. I think it's very important to note right now that the numbers that we're seeing that are dying, that are being hospitalized, 
are a younger age group from what we saw back in March and April. Um, the average age of death is much younger than it was in March and April. And I think it's because um, our younger population just doesn't think it can happen to them. And as Cheryl mentioned, you know, they're out at the restaurants. There's been a lot, a lot of conversation about restaurants opening and whether people can go inside restaurants. Um, there have been studies that show that when you're inside of a building and there are vents that are blowing cool air, those vents can blow those droplets much further than six feet. You know, we're talking about the six feet, but droplets can go much further. Um, evidence has come out now that the droplets can even blow in the wind. And so if you think you're walking down the sidewalk, going to the grocery store behind someone um, who just happens to cough because they didn't put their mask on until they got to the grocery store door that said, you must have on a face covering, those droplets are coming back. Um, I'm a little bit paranoid now about really how close I am to people when I'm going to grocery stores, drug stores, and, and that's about the extent of my outside, um, my outside activities other than things that have to be done. Um, so I think, you know, we really need to be aware that there is going to be an uptick still from um, not so much even the 4th of July, because I think we're in that now, but just because of summer and summer activities, um, people are getting together, they're having house parties, barbecues, cookouts, um, you know, they're in the park. Um, I was out the other day and in a parking lot, there were two pickup truck, um, trucks full of kids, teenagers. Um, who were sitting in the back of the pickup truck, six in one truck and six in another truck, girls in one, boys in another, and they were playing a game of tossing the ball. Well, nobody had on um, protective gear. They definitely weren't six feet apart because they were all sitting in the back of a pickup truck. So there is a lot of um, lack of, you know, conforming to the three things that will help kill this virus. And it's not the heat, it's not the summer, it is protecting ourselves with face coverings so that we don't spread the droplets, two, washing our hands, and three, social distancing. So if we yeah. can do that, we can decrease the incidence of the virus. We can make that virus say, wow, I can't get a host anywhere. Yeah, that you're you're absolutely right, and and, and that's the message, uh, Val. In the time we got left in this segment, are you sufficiently scared now? Uh, are you going to go out anymore? Because I, I Dr. Miltier just made me decide that I'm going to stay in my apartment. I guess I'm gonna have to order everything to my house now. Uh, so, uh, what do you think of all of this, Val? Hearing these smart medical professionals tell us the truth about COVID-19. Where are we right now? Well, I'll tell you where we are. We, we better uh, open our ears and start listening, uh, put politics aside, and start uh, making some decisions based on what's best for me and mine and ours. Uh, you know, we talk, Ed, a lot about the conspiracy theorists who want to say that uh, this whole piece, uh, this whole virus was invented in a laboratory somewhere and spread around and uh, the current administration is trying to say it had something to do with China and so forth. I don't believe that, I'm not one of those type people. But I will say this, if someone wanted to do that, uh, uh, the United States of America is a perfect host. Uh, and the reason we are perfect host is we are super individualist, we are very gregarious, we need other people, we got a lot of hubris with us. And these are the kind of people who say, I want it my way. And I don't have to do this if I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And they are playing right in the hands of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what's got to happen is we've got to look at some of those countries such as South Korea, New Zealand, and some other places who've done well and have folks who want to listen to good leadership and do what's best for everybody 
instead of being so individualistic. Until we tone that down a little bit, we're going to have problems with not only COVID-19, but anything else that may come down the line that require us to be a little bit more, uh, practice a little bit more humility. Well, Val Atkinson, uh, that's going to have to do it for this segment. Uh, I, I want to first, uh, Dr. Regina Miltier, Dr. Angela Elgin, and Dr. Cheryl Catchings, uh, I can't even tell you how much I appreciate you guys taking the opportunity to come in and talk to us. Hopefully this information will get out to the p folks who follow this program. I'd like to invite you guys to come back and give us an update later on because this is not going to be over anytime soon. Uh, we're going to be probably talking about this well into uh, early next year. And, and, and I think uh, we're going to need to have uh, the uh, sage advice from uh, some real medical professionals who want to get us on the right track. So thank you guys for being in with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, so so uh, I want you guys to stick and stay. We're going to take a small break and we will come back. Val Atkinson and I are going to do what we always do, which is run off at the mouth and, and talk about some stuff. But we need to talk about C.T. Vivian, uh, who passed away last night, along with uh, 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 John Lewis, two, two you know giants in civil rights. And we, we want to talk about them, but we also want to talk about what's going to happen in the upcoming elections. Uh, there's a whole bunch of bad stuff going on, folks. So stick and stay. We'll be right back after these messages. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. Once there was a boy who did the same thing again and again. One day, he was told he had autism. He got help and slowly learned how to live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at AutismSpeaks.org. Happy birthday to you. I've never done this before. Happy birthday to you. We're here for Precious. Happy birthday, dear Precious. Day four. You, you may not understand. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, this is chapter 32. And welcome back to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark, along with Val Atkinson. Uh, we just had a very interesting discussion, Val, with uh, three uh, medical professionals, people a lot smarter than us. <laughs> Doctors are Regina Miltier, Dr. Angela Elgin, and Dr. Cheryl Catchings. And we were talking about COVID. I mean, I, you know, Val, the beginning of the discussion was about whether or not kids were going to be able to go back to school, but it's much larger than that. And, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's so much into this and, and, and we'll talk about it some more over the course of the next few months for sure, whether or not kids go back to school, but COVID is not going anywhere. Uh, we're going to be talking about it well into uh, the beginning of the new year. Uh, I did want to switch gears though, Val, in the time that we have left. Um, uh, two people died that are very important to the, even us being here, being able to talk <laughs> in the way that we're talking right now. Uh, C.T. Vivian, Cordy Tyndale Vivian, C.T. Vivian, uh, born on um, July 30th, uh, 1924 in Boonville, Missouri, and uh, John Lewis, uh, born on February 21st, 1940 in Troy, Alabama. And guess what? I've been to both places. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been to 48 of the 50 states, and I've been to a lot of towns in I never would have known that C.T. Vivian was born in Boonville, Missouri. I stopped there at the Casey's to get gas on uh, I-70, <laughs> going from St. Louis uh, uh, back to Kansas City. But anyway, uh, talk to me real quick about the importance of uh, John Lewis and, and C.T. Vivian and, and what it means to lose people like that. Let, let me start, if I might, head with C.T. Vivian. Uh, I had a personal relationship with C.T. Vivian, bought him dinner. Uh, back in the day when we had an organization called TPN here, Triangle Professional Network uh, for African-Americans working and living in the 
Triangle area of North Carolina. Uh, we had a networking piece that we put on once a month. Some people called it First Friday. And uh, as a part of our mandate to have a 501c3 organization, we had to have an educational piece to it. So we'd have seminars each month. And one of those months, we invited C.T. Vivian down to speak to us. And of course, we couldn't pay him what the normal fees, the growing rate was. And he didn't want it because we had a good uh, a crowd and uh, he wanted to have an opportunity to speak before them. So we uh, paid for his lodging and we took him to dinner over at the Holiday Inn and Research Triangle Park and we we dined sufficiently. And uh, that was my first time and last time meeting and, and chatting with and being a part of an audience with C.T. Vivian. And he is a giant. He was a giant and a leader in the civil rights movement. But I'll tell you one thing else about him, Ed. He was equally a good person, just as humble uh, and direct and self-deprecating and just good all the way around that you would not have imagined that he had accomplished and had done all of the things that he's done in life. So I have a special place in memory for CT. Uh, now, now, getting to John Lewis, I got to say, I got to tell you, I had to warm up to uh, Congressman Lewis. And that the reason is uh, he defeated one of my heroes as on his road to becoming a congressman from Georgia. He ran against Julian Bond. I idolized Julian Bond. Uh, met him on a couple of occasions. And uh, to, to hear that John Lewis had uh, defeated him in a runoff election for a congressional seat, it took me a while to warm up to John Lewis because he had defeated Julian Bond. But after I saw the genuineness in uh, Congressman uh, Lewis, I began to warm up to him and saw that he was not selfish. Everything that John Lewis did was about the movement, about the cause, about people he was fighting for, and that impressed me. And from that point on, I've been a huge fan, a huge, huge fan of John Lewis and all he stood for. So uh, we're going to miss both of them. We're yeah. going to miss both of them. They won't be replaced, but we just got to remember what they stood for and make sure we carry on the fight and do the kinds of things that we know that C.T. Vivian and John Lewis would have wanted us to do. Yeah, you, you're definitely right about that. Val, um, one of the things that, that John Lewis is noted for is the whole Edmund Pettus Bridge incident and almost losing his life, um, being hit over the head by the police. But one of the things that came out of that was, I, I think the Voting Rights Act got a real big push from from people seeing what was going on in the South. And, and, and uh, uh, Shelby versus Holder still needs to be dealt with. Uh, and, and the whole notion of, you know, people being able to vote to be able to, to get a representative government is utterly important right now especially since this particular administration doesn't want to do anything about COVID. I think it's pretty clear. And now they're doing something that's, I think, extremely odious and dangerous and fascist, which is scooping people up off the street in Portland. Uh, I, I know you've probably seen this by now, the vans of these soldiers or whatever they are, unmarked, who pull up, throw people in the back of a van and drive off. What can you tell me about, and I know John Lewis is already rolling and he's not in his grave yet, that, 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 that people are being picked up off the street by armed gunmen that are sponsored by the executive branch of the government. What's going on there? This is where you need a real uh, attorney general that's working for the people and not for the president. Because right now we uh, don't have anybody that can give us news we can trust as to what's going on here. For all we know, Ed, these people coming up in unmarked vans with uh, camouflage fatigues on and 
with no markings of kind of unit identification. They could be members of some neo-Nazi or neo-Confederate kind of a clan and doing this on their own. Who knows who they are? Who knows when we need to call in the real police? You know, it's, it's too close to the Brown Church, to the SS and the Gestapo uh, of the 1930s. It's too close to that head and we've got to do something to stop that. I don't think people are really going to realize how close we are to losing the totality of our government. Forget about just marked democracy and voting. I mean the totality of it. I don't believe people are going to realize how close we've come until several decades after this is over when people can honestly look back in an un unencumbered way and, and really uh, find, out, find out exactly what happened. We are in deep, deep trouble. Well, Mary Trump has said is that as much. Uh, that's the niece of Donald Trump. Her, she has a new book out. I, I, I believe everything that I've seen so far. I haven't read the book yet. I've read some excerpts. I've seen her on some interviews like with Rachel Maddow and George Stephanopoulos where um, last night I, I saw an excerpt where she talked about how he freely used the word nigger. I'm not going to say the N word. He, he says it. She says he's anti-Semitic. He's expressed those thoughts openly. Uh, it, it was not uncommon for him to do it. Uh, and uh, he's the president of the United States. She's a psychologist and says that he's unfit. Uh, does it matter that, that she's saying anything now? Is it just reaffirmation of what stuff we already know? And, and will it move anybody at all? Or, or are people so dug into where they are that it doesn't matter what people like Mary Trump say, we already know this. It just is more clarification of who Donald Trump is. Well, like you and I say all the time, Ed, there, there are only three people in the United States who haven't made up their mind about who they're going to vote for. Uh, so this is not going to move the needle. It, it, it just gives those who may have decided to vote against Trump, it gives them more reasons in their family arguments as to why. Just like information on the other side gives people reasons why they are going to vote for Donald Trump. But there are no people out there who are truly on a fence. You know, to, to say that that fence, it has a razor thin edge is an understatement, big time understatement. There are no people out there trying to decide between Biden and Trump and the people in the Biden camp, I wanna say something to them if they are listening right now. You're wasting your money trying to get ads together to convince people that they need to vote for you because of the environment or because of health care or anything else. This is not a battle about persuasion. It is about voter turnout. The other side, they have soldiers, they have strategies to suppress the vote. And I don't know what your strategy is, Mr. Democrat, to make sure that you do something to stop them from suppressing the vote. But instead of stopping them from suppressing the vote, if you're out there in persuasion, trying to get those other three people who ain't made up their mind yet, you're gonna lose this race because you're in the wrong ballpark fighting the wrong fight. This ain't about persuasion. It is about voter turnout. Yeah, absolutely. Val, in the time we got left here, I, I got one more question. This week, for whatever reason, uh, everybody's been talking about polls um, in the last three or four days. And supposedly, you know, the, the, the numbers are looking so bad for Trump and so on and so forth. Uh, we, the polls weren't necessarily wrong the last time where it said Hillary was going to get more votes on the national level. But now these polls are emerging that Donald, Donald Trump has trouble in Texas. He has trouble in Florida. He has trouble in North Carolina. And in Georgia. And in Georgia. Uh, does it, does, do the Democrats need to put effort into not trying to persuade people, but get people out to vote in those places where they typically don't have a chance? Or is it, I just need to look at Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, 
in 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 those states that tipped it the last time in Michigan. What what do you think the the overall strategy is? I know you said that don't go after people and try to persuade them to get out the vote. Are we looking at getting out the vote in places like Texas where they haven't typically been doing that? Well, I think they need to make uh, the Republicans play defense a little bit. Uh, if you go back and look at the last several elections, that's not one of uh, our strategies. Uh, what we do, we get on the defensive and we try to do what we can do to encourage and persuade our people to get out and vote because. And what we don't do enough of is to make them play defense. They don't ever have to guard uh, against their flanks. They don't have to put out a real guard because we don't uh, show any threat of attacking them. We need to get in Florida. We need to get in Georgia. And we need to get in Texas. Those three states, we got to make them pull resources from other places pull resources, and I don't mean just money, I mean good, sharp minds, place them in Texas, Florida, and Georgia because they are afraid to lose them, then it becomes more difficult for them to do their voter suppression in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. That's the kind of strategy we got to have instead of trying to convince the coal miners in, in Kentucky and West Virginia that you got black lungs, so you need to vote Democratic, and we got a health care plan. I don't care how many people in their families in those two states got black lungs, they are still voting Republican. Mm -hmm. And we just need to get smart about that. We need to get smart about that and stop fighting the last battle. You know, generals good. go in and look at how they lost the last battle, make sure that doesn't ever happen again. They're not preparing for the battle that they're in right now and they lose that battle. Then they yeah, wait yeah. to get in the next battle and they'll fight this battle, you know? And yeah, we gotta yeah. stop that. Yeah, it's like the prevent defense that, that never works in, in football, uh, right? Right, that's uh, a good analogy. Yeah. You, you know, Val, uh, time flies. Uh, it, we, we come in here and we try to make sense of the world and, and then and then we run out of time. But uh, I again, I, I just appreciate you uh, taking these Saturdays to come in and, and help us try to make sense of the world. Um, I want to remind the folks that you can find me and Bell on uh, WFXC and WFXK on Foxy 107-104, part of Radio 1 on Sundays, talking about some of the same things we talk about here, uh, sometimes a little more geared locally as well and specific to the state of North Carolina. But we do this program so we can talk about everything else. Uh, Val, as I always ask you, what, what you got going on? What's, what do we need to know about in the coming week? Well, we've got a uh, Mr. Ron Jenkins, who is with the health department of uh, Durham County, will be our guest on uh, Connections uh, coming up in, in a few shows. He wants to talk about COVID-19, to talk about this show here on a local level. So we'll be able to ask him a lot of questions. And between that show and uh, the end of our uh, summer sessions, We'll have a, a three or four sessions, uh, uh, segments rather, on our judicial races. We've been in contact with a lot of people who are running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals, and the North Carolina Supreme Court, and we've made arrangements for them to come in and be a part of the show to talk about how that works and why their race is so important and what's going on. So that's what we're going to be doing on Connections in the coming week and weeks. And we invite people to join us. I must say one last thing, Ed, that also uh, the whole consortium of uh, Bull City Campus and Radio 1 is still alive and well. And we are encouraging people to get out and vote. We're encouraging people to check to see if, in fact, you are still registered to vote. Go online, contact your state board of elections or your county board of elections, and find out if, in fact, they have your name on the registered side. And if not, we have time now to fix that. The day of the election is no time to fix it if they don't have you, if they erroneously taking you off the road to vote. So yeah. do it now. Yep, do it now. And like we always tell you, the voting is so important. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, if, if you are watching this for the first time, please pass it along. This is the deal with Ed Clark. Uh, and you can always go to deal with edclark.com. My most recent piece 
was about a gentleman in Ohio who was about to move to North Carolina, Val. He was about to move to Concord, North Carolina, and he refused to wear a mask. And he went on Facebook every day and made fun of people who, had, who wore masks, said that the president was right in no uncertain terms. Uh, a few days before he was supposed to move to North Carolina, he contracted COVID. And by July the 4th, he was diagnosed on uh, July the 1st. By July the 4th, he was dead. And uh, so we have a column about Mr. Richard Rose III and, and, you know, his whole take on it. And then his change of heart at the very end where he says people need to take it serious. But unfortunately, he lost his life. So uh, that's a somber note. Uh, we also want to remember uh, C.T. Vivian uh, and John Lewis, uh, who passed away. Uh, in the last 24 hours, a, a big loss for the civil rights community. We're going to be back here next Saturday. Uh, and uh, Val, uh, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to go over to Duke University and get somebody to come on. Uh, Nolan Smith, assistant basketball coach of the Duke Blue Devils, is going to be in with us next Saturday. Uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of things, but he's doing some things in the community in Durham. But I think it extends beyond that because the Duke basketball team has really stepped up and talked about Black Lives Matter and a lot of other things. We want to talk to Nolan about that, and you'll be back in with us. And yes. I hope, and I hope the, the the viewers will be back in with us. In the meantime, go out and do something good this week. Uh, uh, talk to a Duke Blue Devil fan if you have to, and uh, we'll we'll see you next. We'll see you next weekend uh, on the deal. Uh, talk to you later. Bye bye. <laughs> Oh, <laughs>